Good afternoon and welcome to Radio Row Super Bowl 57. I'm Kayla Brett. I'm here with Roy Kessel on Radio Row, speaking with three-time World Series coach Trent. Go ahead and show those blingy rings. Trent Clark. Trent, I'm so glad you're here. I, I want to start, Trent, by saying you helped us in a big way on Monday at Tallison Union High School, doing a financial literacy event for 500 students at a Title I school. You were a rock star. They called your name and the kids were cheering. Ray Perkins holds up those rings and the, and the kids went nuts. That's the power of sports and the power of being an athlete, a great coach, an influencer, and truly being influential. So first of all, Trent, thank you. I'm interested in hearing your feedback, what you thought about the event and the kids that were there. Well, I thought Dr. Perkins did a great job of organizing. Obviously, the Sports Philanthropy ne Network, I mean, it was just a fabulous event. And I was so impressed with those kids who came and fully engaged. I mean, these kids came and brought it. I think we had a nearly two-hour program, and there was a lot of fabulous speakers. And I remember at that age, uh, I think I usually zoned out about 35 minutes, 40 minutes into something. And these kids were right on. I didn't see phones out. I didn't see uh, kids falling asleep. They were just right there with every one of these superstar coaches and athletes that were there delivering their message and their experience. So I was so impressed with Dr. Per Dr. Perkins' group and Tullison High School. Yeah, I think it was really uh, incredible, as you said, Trent. Anywhere we go today, and, and, and we're guilty of it as well, right, in terms of having our phones out and we're – we're walking through and instead of absorbing all the energy, even in a place like Radio Row, where we're doing these broadcasts. And then when we take a break, we're walking and everybody's looking down at their phone and missing all the opportunities. And it was so nice at the school to see the kids really engaged. And uh, as you said, it was a long period of, of time. I mean, our attention span usually for speakers is 10 to 15 minutes. And, and that was well over an hour. And, and they were very engaged. And I thought they asked some incredible questions. Yeah, I, that's exactly what I thought. You know, we have an educational NIL program for athletes and influencers, and we literally write that content up at two to six minutes, knowing we will lose kids online if we don't really drive home that message quickly. And that's been all the feedback. So pleasantly surprised. And wow, what a, what a couple great individuals that just came out. So SPN just really brought the noise with some top level talent to talk some shop to these kids. And Boy, I would have loved to have been in that audience as a kid at that age. So, and, and Trent, let's do this. Let's talk a little bit about that NIL program, Leadership Itty, because that's doing some really major work to create impact. Go ahead and shout that out and promote it. Yeah, so we have a company called Athletic Influencer Marketing, AIM, at AIM, uh, AIM uh, for NIL, aim number four, NIL.com. And it, it really just combines my absolute three passions, Kayla and Roy. It is about education, athletics, and entrepreneurship. And so we have a little campaign running right now. Any athlete, any sport at any level can make up to a thousand dollars or more. And so you're seeing these now where you're getting philanthropic athletes. We just had an athlete from Michigan who did a campaign, did a give back, because he's a Florida kid, and after the hurricane hit, some money going back in there, and I saw uh, one of the athletes over at Michigan gave out, I think it was a 1,000 turkey meals uh, with some NIL money that he created. I mean, just you're seeing these kids going, hey, I want a message, and this is awesome for me, but this is awesome for other people too. So there's a lot of wide variety that can happen with the NIL, and we're super excited about just kids really dialing that in as, hey, you're an entrepreneur now, and how would I do my business really well with that? Yeah, and you talked about Blake Corm doing the turkeys at, at Michigan. Um, it, it's fantastic because historically, right, you look at the college athletes, and they have a heart and a passion for giving back. They really want to do something for their community, whether it's their college community, whether it's their hometown. And until NIL, um, they were literally prohibited from doing that in any meaningful way, right? If they uh, didn't have outside funds from their own family that could fund it, they couldn't use the their fame or notoriety 
uh, and exposure from playing a college sport. And so to see that, that's one of the tenets of our NIL for Good platform is to work with the college athletes and help them understand how important it is to give back Okay, which I think many of them really do understand that, but I don't think that they've been given the guidance and support for how they can really implement that and do it. So commend the schools that have taken that leadership role in creating some of these collectives that are focused on the charitable endeavors. Um, You know, Michigan, you talk about Indiana's got a great one. Wisconsin's got a great one that really have taken those um, NIL rights and incorporated them into that philanthropic and and giving thing. And I know Kayla's got some other good examples on that as well. I'm mute. I do, you know, you look at the work that we were blessed to do with Rutgers. Okay, so obviously we're talking Big Ten this morning between the three of us, right? But working on the NIL for Good platform and bringing in Rutgers and the whole Knight Society and all of the money that they were able to raise for Elijah's house in New Brunswick, New Jersey, the food pantry, it just, it blows me away. Because what I see as a mom with eight kids is this commitment, this desire by these college students to create impact, right? Like we're gonna keep seeing this in this next generation. They're making their shopping decisions based on who's giving back, who's creating hope and possibility, who has their beliefs, right? It's now becoming cool not to drink. It's cool not to smoke. That's all that younger generation. So praise God for that. Trent, I have a question for you. Three-time World Series coach turns entrepreneur, NIL, leadership guy. Tell me about your story. Like, where did that come from? What's your why? What, What lights that up where you realize... Sports are done. Moving forward, I'm dedicating my life to this. Tell me that. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of stories in that. But of course, my father was an entrepreneur. He was a college professor. And then he started his own accounting firm. And I've just really spent a lot of time with my father, learned about investing. And uh, I really, you know, I, th- I think I told the story up with the kids that, that you know, as a, as a junior high kid, my dad talked to me about investing and we took my college money and invested that. And then all of a sudden I get scholarship, work hard through high school, save my money and come out of college with no debt and a $30,000 portfolio. I was on my way and thinking like, hey, I can do some things. And I learned how I could make money work while I'm not working, which I thought was really important. And then of course, you know, when I got done, I, w- I was buying companies while I was still in professional baseball. During my 13 years, I have now started 12 companies and I've done franchising. So I'm just, I'm a lifelong learner, Kayla. And I just love to keep going and keep learning. And probably one of the big things, you know, I think there's another factor too. I wasn't a very good employee. <laughs> you know, like I think I had to run my own businesses because I was one of those employees like, hey, we got to change some things like we could do this better. And when you're an uh, athlete and you're all about continuous improvement and competing against the best, you've got to you've got to adapt and overcome all the time. And so there's this hyper learning environment. And I can just recall going into organizations as a corporate employee with that being the lowest end of the totem pole. Right. Like this is the way we've always done it. And I'm like going, oh, my gosh, I am not going to survive here. <laughs> like It's not good. And so that really drove um, that that really had built some self-awareness around, hey, where I really should be and how I could maximize impact. You know, so I, I love that. And what you said and, and uh, forgive me for going back here. But yesterday, the founder of GoDaddy, the CEO of PXG Golf, right? He's in here and he, we ask him, you know, like, what's your story? And he says, I'm always looking to do things better, right? So my, my team at, 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 with the golf clubs keeps saying they're as good as they get. We can't do anything. They just released a new golf ball yesterday. What do you want us to change? And he says, everything. What do you want? Be- what do you want better, boss? Everything. Make everything better. Constant, never-ending improvement, right? And if we could just carry that into our own personal lives and get a little bit better every day, if we could help our kids be better every day, if we could help our teams be better every day, that's where that leadership comes in. That's where that real influence comes in. Roy, I know you talked with him yesterday on a, on a deeper level. I got that quote right, didn't I? Yeah, yeah. Bob yeah. Parsons from PXG really 
uh, focused on quality. And if you look at their clubs and the caliber of their clubs, you know, every generation that they come out with is a, a dramatic improvement. It's not what I call a marketing improvement that a lot of the club manufacturers do where there's, uh, you know, maybe a marginal improvement. So I think that it's, it's, it's really impressive to see what he's done. And Trent, one of the things that I loved about what you talked about, which is preparing for career after sports, right? And preparing yourself as you were playing. Uh, and, and I'm interested from your perspective, because you were there as a coach. We, these guys are elite athletes. You're winning World Series championships. It's easy to kind of rest on your athletic success when you're at that level. Talk a little bit about what does and doesn't happen, you know, within the organizations, not not from a finger pointing perspective, but just from a learning perspective, because we've seen many times athletes come to us and say, yeah, I was there for five or 10 years during a career, and I never had an opportunity to learn either about how to give back through philanthropy or how to prepare myself for a business career after I was done with sports. Yeah, I do think all the leagues have done a better job about really creating a, an opportunity to learn. They, right from the time you come into rookie camp, they're starting to talk about building your skills. I don't know if the kids are always listening, right? Because they're pretty focused on, I got to do my job really well and stay. And I think that's really important. But it does take a special athlete in the offseason to be thinking, hey, I should be going back and like developing my skills. I love the fact that Shaq went back to school and got his degree. I mean, I, I think lifelong learning has got to be taken from it. And one of the things that I think really these athletes miss a ton is, and, and we're not telling them either, by the way, is that you're developing a bunch of skills in professional athletics and it is hyper learning. I mean, the best in the world are coming together in this environment. And when they get in there, they are going to absolutely um, learn from the best in the world, the coaches, they're going to get all that. And these, these young players are also been coached by all the best. So everybody checks their ego at the door and we go in there and we just learn tons of things together on how we can keep progressing together. And that's what good teams do. Right. And, you know, Kayla, you kind of hit it too. Is like, Hey, the moment you stop learning, the, the moment you stop progressing. And I think we've seen this play out in, in the league and, and in organizations where it's like, Hey, eight, no. And you end the league at, nine and seven you're like wait a minute what happened like hey everyone else got better we we started getting full we stopped practicing as hard we stopped progressing and so it, it's subconscious and so the one thing i'd really love athletes to get is that they have tons of skills that they develop inside the game they are absolutely the competitiveness that they bring to an organization the learning and adaptability is second to none i mean Coachability is our number one itty, right? If we're looking at leadershipity, and I'm talking about where am I going to develop my team, coachability gets at that top of the list because we know we're going to have to adapt and change. We know we're going to have to develop. So we need that asset and that skill set. So it's it's one of the reasons I also love NIL. I love the NCAA's line. Hey, 98% are going pro in something else, right? And so when you have a young athlete, we have a, quite a few of them in our agency, and they're going to graduate having run a business of $300,000 to a million dollars of revenue through their LLC. And they're going to go to a, a, someone like you, Roy, or someone like you, Kayla, and ask for a job and go, well, hey, I ran a P&L of about $150,000 a year. Uh, here's three chief marketing officers that would speak on my behalf as references. Uh, I understand branding. I understand sales. I understand customer service. And I'm like, wait a minute. You just, you just surpassed you know, 99% of college students. And now you throw on the time management of I played a sport. I got great grades and I ran a couple hundred thousand dollars of a company going, I mean, I'm, I got one word hired right now. Hired. And, and right? I want to jump in there. You said 99% of, of athletes. I, I think that they surpass 99% of business owners. If you look at the small business world as a whole, it's, it's even greater than that. And, yeah. and I want to jump in there too, because I can see Alana right behind Roy on my screen. She's one of our interns. We have a lot of them. We dedicate our entire internship cohorts, and we've had quite a few now, what are we at, 11 cohorts, to soft skills, right? So our internships are de designed around soft skills so that when these college students graduate and they go in and they say, 
I'm entry level. You're going to teach me whatever you need to know. But in my internship with Sports Philanthropy Network, I learned initiative, communication, and effort. I'd hire that kid on the spot, right? Right and I, I think those are the things that we need to keep pushing. It's that humility trend that you talked about, right? Like coachability, humbleness, it's initiative, it's communication, it's effort, it's dedication, it's no excuses, it's a no entitlement. Anybody who's got anywhere in sports or business got there through long hours, reading a ton of book, books are above them. I want to say, Trent, thank you for being here. My name is Kayla Bradham. I'm here with Roy Castle from Sports Philanthropy Network. You see our intern, Alana, in the background. Trent, three-time World Series coach, thank you for joining us at Super Bowl 57 on Radio Row. High five for all the work you're doing in the community. You know you have my full support. Guys, we want to remind you, give generously. Live generously. Thanks, Trent.